Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Universal Design and Accessible Documents. I am Rachel Combs, and I will be serving as moderator today. I want to welcome everyone to our second webinar of the Kentucky Inclusive Higher Education webinar series that will be offered throughout the 2019-2020 academic year. This series is aimed at increasing knowledge of universal design, disability in higher education, and is a collaboration of the Kentucky Works Post-Secondary Work Team, the Human Development Institute, the Commonwealth Council on Developmental Disabilities, and the Higher Education Recruitment Consortium. We will be using live captioning today, but we recognize that the technology is not always 100% accurate. However, it is intended to help improve the accessibility of the webinar for everyone. The video recording will be made available online to those who registered, and we will be sending that link out in the next few days. We ask the audience to hold questions until the end of the presentation, and we also ask that you complete the evaluation that will be made available at the end of the webinar. Now I'm pleased to introduce our presenter today, Patty Singleton. Patty is the Professional Learning Coordinator at the Human Development Institute. She provides support across the Institute for Learning and Technology Initiatives. Patty, we're so glad to have you lead this conversation today. So now I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. And um, I've included a picture of both my children on this slide because I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own experiences with their, um, their learning and um, how universal design has really impacted how I support and help them. Rachel has mentioned this, but we do have um, some materials available. Um, this link will actually take you to a Dropbox folder that has a handout and a PowerPoint presentation and then some additional supplemental resources. So if you haven't already, take a minute to access these materials. The handout references will be on the slides. And so this is indicated at the bottom right with um, page one. Let's start by defining what we mean by universal design. I think it's easier to start by talking first about physical space or maybe like the built environment. As Rachel mentioned, I work at the University of Kentucky. We have a campus with many older buildings. Though they are beautiful spaces, they are largely inaccessible. Accessible entrances with ramps or automatic doors are limited. Elevators may have been installed after the building opened, and accessible restrooms may not be available on every floor. What I love about the photo on this slide is that the ramp is actually built into the stairs. So a person with a physical disability is able to travel with companions using the stairs. This quote by Meyer, Rose, and Gordon really gets to the essence of universal design. What is essential for some is almost always good for all. Recently, I've piloted a course that embedded many universal design strategies. I have to say that the feedback for the course has been overwhelmingly positive. My pilot included several faculty members, and even they said the information was easy to read and understand. To recap the first webinar in this series, we started a conversation about disability. It's important to remember that one in five people have a disability. In the course folder, there is a supplemental handout with information about disabilities. This includes several online simulators you can use to see and hear what vision and hearing impairments are like. The hearing loss simulator, simulator was the first time I was able to experience what my own mother had been going through with her hearing impairment. I am now more aware of sidebar conversations in meetings and trainings and what that means for those with a hearing impairment. When we said universal design is almost always good for all, 
the truth is we don't know what the education and experiences of every learner who accesses the information we are providing. You may have a learner with a different cultural background, someone that English is not their native language, learners with different attention spans and interests, some who come from different educational backgrounds, and there may be a learner with a formal accommodations request. Using universal design strategies means that most accommodations would have already been taken care of. No additional changes are needed to meet the accommodation request. Our strategies can be summed up in one acronym, which is JUST, or J-U-S-T. We're gonna spend the bulk of the webinar reviewing these strategies. Remember that the handout is available in the course folder. Our first strategy is to J, jazz it up. Boring presentations are not universally designed. A survey of college students found that none preferred a boring presentation. So what are some of the ways you can jazz up your information? The first way you can jazz up your information is by understanding what your audience wants to know. When I develop new content, I generally use a needs assessment to determine what my audience already knows. I don't like to bore people with details they may already know. A great way to do this is to use polling and assessment. A second idea is to tell a story, something that is short, rich, and entertaining. Learners relate to stories that are real and are told from the perspective of the individual. Storytelling is a universal language. We learn through the experiences of others. Stories can be written, audio, and or video. StoryCorps has a rich library of two to three minute audio and video stories that can be linked in your materials. The StoryCorps library is extensive and easy to search. Finally, using meaningful visuals. Don't insert images just to use images. Make sure they add to the content. I like to embed emojis, those quick icons that can add just a little interest. You'll see emojis used in the course handout. There is an entire Emojipedia that is an emoji encyclopedia available online. The image on the screen was developed by a graphic artist we have on staff. In the chat, try to guess what the topic this image relates to. Math class. <laughs> Caroline, that's my response as well. All right, yes, absolutely. Everyone pretty much got the, the gist of what this, um, what this image was really trying to convey. Our first strategy was J, to jazz it up. Take a minute to share with your colleagues. In the chat, describe one way you are already jazzing up your information. Lots of videos, images, meaningful images. That's great. Stories, videos. So a lot of bitmojis, those are fun. Use of color, that's great hope. All right, so we've got some really great ideas. Our first strategy was to jazz it up. Our second strategy is to use multiple methods taking a look at your material through the lens of the user. Are you giving a lecture for an hour? Do you have a 25 page orientation manual of just text? Why not incorporate some additional methods to break up the material? One idea is to allow the learner to customize materials. 
For example, a learner may need a document printed in 15 point font. Another learner may prefer a serial font, I'm sorry, ser serif font. Yet another learner might prefer the information be loaded into a program on their iPad. I like to give access to my documents using a public Dropbox folder and a bit.ly link. These instructions are saved in the course document folder. Typically, I give access to the course folder at least 24 hours in advance. This gives learners time to access and make modifications to the materials. Also, using bit.ly is easier than a user trying to type in a long URL, like the one from the Dropbox that is displayed. Another recommendation is to embed captions in alternative text. Alternative text gives context for the image. This is important for individuals using assistive technology like screen readers. It's also helpful should someone be on a bad connection and cannot download an image. Alt text also increases your searchability score in search engines. In the chat, I want you to develop a short statement of alternative text you would use for the image that's on the screen. All right, we've got four children playing with foam letters in a spool. Anyone else want to take a crack? Four girls in activity, four children hovering over a box of house building model pieces. You really looked at the picture, Barb. Four girls ex experience exploring a house building pieces in a library. All right, so we kind of get the gist of all of it. Um, you can kind of see that the suggestions are really kind of um they, they vary a little bit that's because alt text will depend largely on the context of its use the picture in this image can be used for a presentation on library activities on friendships inclusion or even for fine motor games for teens so if i was to look at our catalog of images i wouldn't necessarily have a standard bank of alt text that would be used for that image every single time. It really largely depends on that context. All right, so figures and graphs also need to have alt text included. In the chat, develop alt text for this flow chart. And Caroline Gooden, you have done this before, and so you can refrain from answering. All right, Luann says a flow chart on when a lamp does not work. Troubleshooting a lamp. Problem solving. So the alt text is providing a text alternative to the image. So although it, you are providing a great example of what the alt text um, title might be, if we do not have um, text that goes along with this image, we do have to provide the full context within the alt text and so you might actually walk through does the lamp work check first if it's plugged in if not plug in the lamp if it is plugged in is the bulb burned out so if you don't have that text written out anywhere else which you might not for a simple graphic like this 
then you would want to include the full explanation of what that what that image really is trying to um, say. Does that make sense? For the most part, and this is this is largely for um, PCs to add the alt text, you're going to right click on the image. And depending on your version of Office, you'll have an option to either format the picture or directly edit the alt text. Max, obviously, you have different instructions. And it's there that you're going to enter a brief description of the image. And Dana asks, what is what about a much more complex decision tree? And Dana, what I would tell you is that if there is not a text explanation, um, like in a report, then you would have to have some pretty extensive alt text to go along with that um, with that image or with that graphic. Um, and so one of we're going to talk in a little bit about simplifying our materials. And so, um, you know, one of the suggestions might be to take a, a complex decision tree and maybe break it down into multiple images. So adding alt text is fairly simple. I have found that the more recent versions of Office um, including Office 365, those accessibility tools um, are becoming more and um, more and more easy to use and are more accessible in that they're kind of right there. You don't have to go through multiple menus to find them. And, um, and so, yeah, Dana, the alt text would be impossibly confusing for a large decision tree. Um, but is a large decision tree impossibly confusing to begin with? So we'll talk about that in, in, this, in the next section when we talk about simplifying text. So captioning and transcription. If you haven't already noticed, we actually have a live um, captioner. And so in your Zoom window, you should have the option to turn the captions on. There's a lot of reasons why we use captions. So you can see that um, this is an image from a YouTube video and we have the closed captioning on. Closed captioning can be turned on and off. Open captioning is captioning that is always available. We also have a transcript. And so the captioning runs as the video is playing and a transcript is um, the entire um all of the text from the entire uh, from the captioning keep the chat chat bubbles in the cc from popping up on top of each other um so i think you can move the chat bubble try going into full screen and see if you can get the chat bubble to move um, out of the Zoom window. I know that there's different display options and usually you can customize the Zoom window. Um, I could see where that, that could get really crazy. So let me know if that works. Um, try either putting it into full screen or take it out of full screen and see if you can get that chat to move. So the captions run along the bottom of the video as the video is played and a transcript is a single document with everything stated in the video. Sometimes the transcript will also include the timestamp. 85% of Facebook videos are watched with the captions on. So in the chat, why do you like to watch videos with the captions on? Take a minute and type something in the chat. Oh, some really great conversation here. 
So Jill says it's her learning style and she does better when she sees and hears it. Um, make sure I don't, I didn't understand the spoken word, so yeah. When you're in, in an area where you don't have the sound on, I find that a lot. Um, you know, if I if I want to watch a video and not and make sure that my kids don't you know run over when I'm on my phone, I tend to to turn the captions on just so that they're not alerted to a video. Doesn't disturb others. Helps me catch words when spoken quickly or qualify, um, or if the quality isn't high. All right, Mary says that she has significant hearing loss and she loses a lot of spoken words. Um, my mom's the same way. I, whenever she visits, she always turns the closed captioning on for all of our TVs and I never know how to turn it off. So um, generally the closed captioning now just stays on all the time. Barb says, I can't always hear what the speaker is saying or if there are accents, I can't understand. Absolutely. Beth says it reduces distractions. Perfect. These are all really great, great conversation. Rachel says she likes to um, turn it on when running at the um, treadmill at the gym. So absolutely. YouTube allows uploaded videos to be automatically captioned. Make sure you don't rely on auto captions alone. Auto captions are less than 80% accurate. There are some poor caption examples on this slide. So I actually, um, there's, a, there's a movement called Craptions, hashtag Craptions, and you can find some really funny examples of um, bad captioning gone wrong. And so these are, we've got two that are um, auto captioned for live TV, and then we've got two internet videos that have been captioned. But the, the live caption or the auto captions, they're really not capturing, they're not even close to capturing the essence of what's going on. The woman who's cooking says, my wallet is gone. Here we go. I realize how good I smell after being down in there. Um, so nothing having to do with what she's cooking. Um, and the baseball player was drafted out of jail, probably not what they were actually talking about. And then the internet videos, we've got Pikachu, Peach, Pichu, instead of Pikachu, at first hated going to your bro give mom. Um, so something probably about Pokemon. My son is a huge Pokemon fan. And then we've got the woman that says, too young to buy sheep today probably not even close to what they actually said. So I actually pulled a caption fail um, off of a university video. So try to guess what we're trying to say here. Take advantage of exceptional Birch Unity with World Cat class backers. Anyone want to take a guess at what was actually being said? So it says, take advantage of exceptional research opportunities. So you all got opportunity with world-class faculty. If you are gambling on only 80% of your captions being correct, you really have to ask yourself, is your message getting across? At HDI, we use a paid service that captions for us. At prices starting at $1 a minute, it's worth the investment for accurate captions. In the course folder, you will find a document with information on approved captioning services at the University of Kentucky. That includes both live captioning, we're using game day captions right now, and, um, and that, that document has the contact information for game day captions, but then also for our recorded videos. And so if you're producing materials and you need captioning services, I have three um, options listed that uh, are approved at the University of Kentucky. So in the chat, 
let's discuss what is one way you are using multiple methods to present your information. Kate said that she's using video demos. We do a lot of videos to um, record how to use software and how to use technology. Discussion boards, text and audio, PowerPoint and handouts go hand in hand, audio with transcription. Videos, peer discussions, games and video submissions. Dana says she inter uses interactive options. Blackboard Collaborate, and so just like Zoom, you have the option of, of doing a web-based meeting. And Patty likes to break up her content with lecture in the morning and stations in the afternoon. So really some great ideas. Our first strategy was to jazz it up. The second strategy is to use multiple methods. And now our third strategy is to simplify. Simplifying text is not dumbing it down. It's writing to maximize the information you are providing. Think about it like recent trends in simplifying your wardrobe or decluttering your kitchen. The first recommendation to simplify your information is to use what is called plain language. There is a document in the course folder with recommendations on using plain language. For me, this is a way to get to make sure that my audience can understand the information I'm providing. Generally, for professionals, we write at a ninth grade reading level. If the intended audience is for family members, we, keep, we try to keep it to a fifth grade reading level. The course I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar was written using plain language, and we got it down to an eighth grade reading level. The feedback from every learner was the same. The information was very easy to understand. This came from both faculty and staff. Let's practice using plain language. In the chat, make recommendations on how you can simplify these statements. This practice document is also available to download in the course folder. So these are all great suggestions. In the course folder, the plain language recommendation document has tools you can use to help make your information more clear. I use a paid service called Readable to help me understand not only what my overall reading level is, but also how formal is my document. It helps me to identify which are the longest sentences and so I can really go in and work there first to try and minimize my long sentences and it generally recommends that you keep sentences under 15 words and so anything over um, 30 syllables is really a very long sentence. So it, it that's really helped me. Um, Grammarly.com has a free plugin for Microsoft Office, or you can also add it to your web browser. Grammarly is another one. 
that can make some really great recommendations. Um, and then Office 365, the latest version of Office, actually has some editing tools that help with rewriting and will help you not only identify your spelling and grammar mistakes, but it also helps you to identify phrases that you can use to, um, th that you can simplify. So those are really great tools. Um, and then there is an online thesaurus that's wordhippo.com. And um, what I like about that thesaurus over other online thesaurus is that it actually will help you to um, reword phrases instead of just single words. So um, Word Hippo is the one that I probably use the most. And then we have the, some of the recommendations. There are some professional thesauruses out there. So there are legal plain language thesauruses that you can use. And then the um, Center for Disease Control also has a great thesaurus for medical professionals um, that is this kind of the same thing where it has, um, you know, replacements for common words in the medical profession. Another way to simplify is to use bulleted lists. Long lists of items can be hard to read. Bullets can help put the information into short, consumable statements. Bullets help to separate points or ideas. Finally, they can encourage further reading by embedding links. An example of an embedded link in a bulleted list is in the course handout on page two. Using large, easy to read fonts is our next recommendation. So there are two different font families. There are the serifs, which are at the top, and then there are sans serifs. A history on the serifs, they actually date back to when Romans used stone carvings. The additional serifs were added to help distinguish letters. People tend to think serifs have a distinguished quality because of their traditional look. Current recommendations are used to, are to use sans serifs with your text. However, allowing the user to customize to their font pre preference is the best option. According to a study with students diagnosed with dyslexia, the fonts listed here had the best eye tracking and user preference scores. So we have a list of several fonts to use. Avoid overly stylized fonts like the ones listed. These are harder to read, especially when displayed on a projector. Some additional recommendations are to only use underline when indicating a link. Do not use underline as an emphasis. Italics can also hinder readability. Use sparingly on single words or short phrases. Your font size should be at least 11 point, if not larger. Know your audience. For example, if you are writing at a third grade level, you'll want to use a larger font. I show this as an example because when my son was in kindergarten, he would try to mimic the styles of the fonts. He's a very concrete thinker. Even with the recommended fonts, which are listed, None of them are close to how he has learned to write. Century Gothic is his preferred font, but it still has a closed four at the top. This again goes back to allowing a learner to customize their document. If they have a preferred font, they should be able to use it. And Victoria asked about dyslexic fonts. And Jennifer about printed and online text. So again, um, having the user customization is really important. Um, the dyslexic font recommendation is Verdanda. That's the top um, font. However, I do find 
that again, it, it's not always the way that we're taught to write. And so depending on how, um, how the learner conceptualizes their letters, it might, that might not be the best font option for them. There are some dyslexic fonts that have a little bit more weight at the bottom, which is supposed to help them, but those are not standard to like word processing. Um, Scott's been using Calgary and that's absolutely fine. Um, it's, I, to me, that's very similar to what Apple uses, which is that San Francisco font. Um, it's the default, and so it's what has a lot of research behind it in terms of readability and usability. Um, and Jennifer, again, the um, the fonts that we tend to go towards um, Open Sans is usually the the preferred font. Um, but I will say that, um, and I didn't include this in my um, presentation. But we have started using a new, I'll pull up one of our um, HDI websites. This is our uh, online learning center. Let me log out real quick so it's a little bit easier. But um, so we do have this accessibility menu. And this is through UserWay. And it is free. So what you're seeing, this whole accessibility menu is actually a free plugin. And it will add up, actually give a lot of customization to the user. And so a lot of what we were just talking about, um, you know, we, we do have a font that's pretty small in our online learning center, but this gives a learner the option of making the text larger. They can change the style of the fonts, and they can even add more contrast. So again, this is through UserWay, and I didn't include many web resources um, or resources about web development, but this is one that we're using a lot across all of our websites now to make sure that we are providing um, accessible web experiences. And what's great about this is that it, it does do all of the work for us. Um, we don't have to embed specific accessibility um, on every single page. Um, you know, even, even its page reader is um, really very good considering it's an automatic reader. So um, this user way is, is what my recommendation would be. And like I said, it's free, um, which is amazing. Um, and Victoria, you can just go to user way, accessibility tool. So I can put this. And, um, It'll just walk you through how to get it on your website. And we've been using it, I think, for since August. And um, they've already made one update to it. So that's really awesome. Um, you know, it, it, it is, it continues to be updated. All right, some really great conversations about fonts. And that's what generally I, I do. Um, there's always a lot of questions and we, you know, more science is coming out. We're, we're seeing more research around fonts. We see preferences change. Um, I remember when, when the new version of windows changed from the default of times new Roman to Calvary and, you know, just kind of all those feelings that came out. I, I preferred it as, um, somebody that's whatever is between gen X and millennial. Um, you know, it, it, that, that was definitely my preference, but I know that other people had um, uh, strong feelings when that did change. All right, so any other questions about fonts? That was, those were some, that was good discussion. Okay, our next recommendation is using heading styles. And I have an example of what the styles toolbar looks like in Word. 
So there are a few reasons why we should use headings. Um, and I'll give you two examples um, that of people that I've actually worked with. And so imagine being someone who is blind and you have access to a course syllabus, which you use your assistive technology to read to you. You need to find the due date for an assignment. The course syllabus is 26 pages long. You would have to listen to the entire syllabus to find that one due date. If the instructor would have used built-in headings, you could use the navigation to jump to the section of the course labeled due dates. So the navigation that that builds into a Word document is really pretty incredible. I use that a lot to jump around in Word documents. A second example may be your master's thesis. It's 245 pages long. You just realized your level two headings should be bolded and centered. This means you must go through all 245 pages, find any level two headings, and bold and center it. Had you used the built-in heading styles, you could make all level two headings bold and centered with just a few clicks. And that is a real example. I've worked with um, graduate students in the past to help them understand how to use the heading styles because they were um, doing it all manually. Um, but really, you can modify these styles, you can add new styles. It's really pretty great. If you've never modified heading styles, there are plenty of websites and YouTube videos that deal with this specific topic and um, so we won't go too far into it because there are so many resources out there um, and what's great is that it does transfer to a pdf and so if you like that look of all that navigation within a within a pdf if you use those heading styles in your word document before you convert it to a pdf then all that navigation is there and it really makes it a, a, a an easier document The next recommendation for simplification is making good use of white space. And just know that this is intentionally blurry. White space is the empty space around a document. The example on the left has much more text. The subtitle is longer. There's not as much space between the columns. So the page looks really crowded. Rather than having lots of text, using white space really kind of defines the areas of the document on the in the version on the right. This gives your eyes and your brain a break. This is another example from the Center for Plain Language in the CDC's Epidemic Intelligence Service website. So these are two versions of their website. The revised site has simpler headings and stronger graphics. The site uses a user-centered design that has simple language and navigation that helps different audiences find the information they are looking for. Here are examples of slide design with better use of white space. The top right slide are several, several quotes from Steve Jobs. The remaining examples are the same quotes, but single quotes per slide and a powerful image. Which grabs your attention more? Use the chat to respond. Caroline says a cleaner one. So I, I feel like the original one to me, it just looks like a standard PowerPoint slide, but the after ones, they're simple and they're, I mean, they're beautiful. They're, they're really, it's a neat use of space with the bolding, the larger letters. It really kind of catches your eye. And I think that if it would have been in the original, if I would have been in a session with the original, I probably would have just kind of glanced over these, but nothing really would have stuck out. Yeah, Veronica, I always feel like I am 
losing real estate when I use white space. But I think looking at these before and afters, it, it does help me to remember that you really do have to include strong visuals and, and, and good use of white space. All right, so now take a moment to give one additional way you are already simplifying your information. Use the chat to respond now. All right, so we've got some good use of bulleted lists, which is awesome. All right, so to review, we've looked at strategies to jazz it up, use multiple methods, and simplify. Our final strategy is T, to test it out. We're gonna start looking for people who can help us provide feedback. At HDI, we're really fortunate to have not only individuals with disabilities on staff, but also a consumer advisory board that helps us provide feedback to the, to the content that we're developing. Microsoft and Adobe products have built in accessibility tools. Using the accessibility checker during product development or after to make sure your documents meet accessibility standards. Other accessibility tools can help with color contrast, grammar, and readability. Several resources are listed in the course handout. So are there any other methods that you're using to test out your materials? pilot testing, students with disabilities for feedback. So those are great. Blackboard has Ally built in. That's great feedback. So I hope our JUST model has given you some new strategies to consider. The handout and resources are yours to keep and I would definitely recommend downloading them. Although I will keep that, um, that link up and active. You may ask yourself, why is universal design important? For me, it's money. It's less expensive for me to create universally designed materials than to have to edit documents later to meet accommodations. For this webinar, we did not need to ask for accommodation requests because we had already planned to meet the needs of all learners. In addition, there are federal laws that say that we as government entities should provide education in the least restrictive environment and to use simple language. Harvard and MIT are having to pay in a big way. This lawsuit was filed by the National Association of the Deaf. This claim is that much of their course material provided lacks closed captioning or that the captions are inadequate. Remember our discussion about captions. Both universities have masses amounts of online material. So in closing, I don't create perfectly accessible documents every single time. There are things that I do to make my documents more accessible, and there are things that I do to make my documents less accessible. Margaret Atwood said, if I waited for perfection, I would never write a word. I don't personally expect perfection every time. I try my hardest with the resources I have available. To wrap up, go ahead and use the chat to ask one additional question you have. As we are running close on time, be sure to include your email and I'll be happy to get back with you. And Dana was, was talking about data visualization and, the, and how it, they kind of mirror each other, absolutely. And Rachel, since both my screens are taken up, um, can you provide the bit.ly link?
Yes, I'll do that in just one second. Sorry. You're fine. All right. Um, if you want to continue the conversation, you're welcome to contact me. My email is patty.neighbor, N-A-B-E-R, at U-K-Y dot E-D-U. Okay, thank you so much to Patty for sharing today. And I just wanted to open up the floor for any questions. All right, so... Um, Emily asks, is there a way to add captions to PowerPoint presentations? So Emily, the um, Office 365 version of, does have built-in captioning, so I can actually turn this on. But these are all auto-generated captions. And if you participated in the last um, webinar, they were not anywhere close to being perfect. And so, um, yes, you can add the captions to a PowerPoint presentation, but you, I would give the disclaimer at the beginning of your presentation that they are auto-generated. And these actually weren't that bad. Okay, so some of the other questions. Um, Mary asks, what's the best way to take an existing document that scores, scores low on the accessibility scale and make it better? So we talked a lot about um, adding the alt text. Um, there, it, it, when you run the accessibility checker, you're going to have recommendations. And so it might be the reading order. It might be that you have um, too large of chunks of content. And so you need to break that content up a little bit. Um, the readable website that I mentioned earlier, and the link to that is in the course handout, um, you can actually use that for 10 minutes a day for free. And so you could plug your content into that and have it read um, through your, your content. And then it'll give you some, um, it'll kind of highlight the areas of your document that, that have the longest sentences. Um, so, and, and Mary, I'm happy to continue that conversation with you if you want to email me. Um, Patty asks, when adding alt text to photos, are you talking about setting up a website like in WordPress? So yes, um, alt text should be in photos, alt text should be included in emails. So if you're inserting an image in an email, so think about newsletters, think about um, large emails that you send out. If you are um, creating a PowerPoint presentation, it's important to include your um, the alt text in your images there. So yes, alt text should always be used when an image is used. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, I just uh, put something in the chat box, but if you please wouldn't mind, if you all wouldn't mind to um, complete the survey, it's just a few questions. We just want to measure how helpful this was. Um, so if you could just take a few minutes, I'll also send that link out in an email as well. But um, I want to thank Patty again for today. I think this was a great discussion. Um, one announcement is that our next IHE webinar um, will be on Thursday, January the 23rd. And that one is titled Universal Design for Learning, Designing Classrooms for All Learners. The registration is now open, and I did send that um, link in the chat box, but I will be happy to share that in the email as well. Um, another thing I wanted to let you all know is that even if you did attend the live session, I will be sending out a link to the video once um, the recording is complete. So be on the lookout for that as well. And I just Really appreciate you all attending and um, please let us know what we can do to help. All right, and I can go ahead and take some of these other. So Patty asks, she just doesn't see alt text to Word documents. So Patty, when you right click, it's either gonna be format picture or add alt text. It's really depending on what version you have. And um, 
I am using, oh, that was probably for Patty. Um, yeah, it depends on your version of Word. And then Mom Allie, look for a color contrast analyzer. Oh, I sent that to Adam. Um, so look for a color contrast analyzer. Um, I actually have one installed on my computer. I can, um, I can actually show you the one that I have installed. And what's nice about this is that I can pick the foreground color, which would be white, and then the background color, which would be the blue. And then it's going to tell me if it meets minimum standards. So um, it failed for regular text, which would be like in a document, but large text would be obviously for a presentation. Um, but I did fail the enhanced. So, um, so this color contrast analyzer, it's called the CCA. This has been my favorite one um, I, because I am able just to use the, um, my, the dropper to, to choose the colors. Um, and it really helps me to determine whether or not I need accessibility standards, which obviously I do not. And then Chrissy asked to see the user way. So that's on here. I'll leave this one over to the side. So this is the HDI learning website. And so you can see it's this user way accessibility tool and you literally just have to plug in your website and then it walks you through how to install it. So at the Human Development Institute, we're slowly adding this to all of our websites only because then we don't have to worry about embedding other accessibility tools on every page. Yes, and the WAVE tool will actually give you, um, so if you plug in your website, it'll actually give you the errors um, in WAVE. Um, the Web AIM is a fantastic um, collaboration between multiple universities, and they have some great information on accessibility. So we, I can pull in my we'll look up the HDI website and it has, it will list the errors, the contrast errors that you have, um, and then any alerts, which are just things that you might want to look at. All right. Well, thank you all so much. This was a great conversation. Great questions and feel free to email me if you have any additional questions. Thank you so much, Patty.